Good morning. My name is Michael McGee. I'm the Director for State Government Relations at the Chancellor's Office. Um, I've joined uh, the committee with FAC and the sponsors, J.P. Morgan and our foundation for this conference. Um, I work obviously in the in Sacramento area and a number of issues have come up related to student veterans as well as uh, education in general, uh, but more so recently in how to, um, it affects priority registration and other issues with respect to academic um, interaction with the, the student veterans. Uh, I contacted Dr. Purnell to do s some more research on um, uh, academic credit and military coursework and I found out he is one of our experts and also a fellow alumnus of the United States Air Force Academy, former military officer, and someone who has a doctorate in studying military education. He's also the chief instructional officer at Rio Hondo College and vice president of academic affairs. So I'd like you all to welcome um, Dr. Purnell. And uh, thank you, Mike. Um, well, uh, between Mike and I, we uh, the last presentation, I, th I really enjoyed that. Did, did all of you enjoy the presentation? I thought that was terrific. He gave a, a great summary. And um, I actually, my, my presentation uh, is, uh, is going to evolve. But to start off with a little bit of humor, when Mike and I were probably the same thing, when we were at the uh, Air Force Academy, uh, we referred to the other services as institutions with hundreds of years of experience unhampered by progress. And, uh, <laughs> And so you'll get a little bit of an Air Force bias, but we are all one team. And uh, th this networking that uh, we want to encourage people to participate in, and you are the network. You know what a summit is, don't you? It's when um, experts and leaders gather together. And so the experts and leaders are not necessarily me or Mike. The experts and leaders really are you out, out here in the uh, audience. And uh, so uh, it's, I'm, really, I'm honored and I'm humbled to, uh, to, to have been asked. Uh, but it came from networking because uh, Dr. Manuel Baca, who was one of my professors for uh, uh, political science at, uh, at Rio Hondo College uh, is, and is also on the Board of Governors and is also a trustee at uh, Mount San Antonio College and also has grandkids and raises a family and goes golfing and, um, and so, um, uh, uh, Dr. Baca, Manny uh, contacted Mike and their relationship and found out that uh, I had an uh, uh, Air Force background and, uh, and so to some degree that's why I'm here. Same thing happened to me when I was at um, Chafee College. Uh, I was the Dean for Behavioral and Social Sciences and we had a floundering aeronautics program and you know the classic social science is aeronautics, right? So, so I got the aeronautics program and it flourished by the way. And, uh, it flourished because we became a team and we treat as a team, not that I knew a whole lot about aeronautics. What I think I'm going to do, and my presentation uh, has evolved and, is, and uh, is evolving as, we, as, we, uh, as you sit here and I stand here. This, uh, this presentation was going to be, um, and one of my good staff just came in, uh, Adelie Rodarte, right here from uh, Rio Hondo College. She helped me put this together. Um, I really only have eight slides and so now I've decided to uh, do uh, three things. You all are the experts, and the first thing I'm gonna do is try to put a face to what the last presenter, uh, Michael, gave to us from Long Beach. I want, I want you to feel and hear, and unfortunately, it's gonna be at, at your expense and my pleasure because I get to tell you my story. And so I'm gonna do that for a few minutes. Uh, but I do think it has some relevance because that decision that I'm making right now to not go with the, 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 the slides that I have, and I'll, I'll get to those in a few minutes, there's some great information on those slides, is because I think from last night, um, how many of you were here last night, by the way? Oh, that was powerful to me, to, to feel uh, these actor, actresses, actor and actress, uh, portray real life military feelings. And I'm gonna share some of those of my feelings with you because I think it is relevant. I think if you don't um, um, look someone in the eye, if you don't touch someone else, it, it's not as real. So, uh, so, uh, that's, so I'm gonna do three things. The first thing is to share you a little bit of a, of a saga, and, and I hope it, it, 
it gives a face to what uh, was presented. The second thing is I'll go over these slides and give you some information. A lot of this information has come from the people like our veterans, the Resource Center, uh, Otto Lee and Sylvia Dronkotnik, and, um, and then I have a student worker. He served um, three tours, two in Afghanistan, one in Iraq. Uh, Tim Oredin is his name. And uh, Tim has given me some information, and that will be on those slides. And then if there's any time left, since I've already given you the lead in here, you are the experts. You're the leaders at your campus and your community. And because of that, whatever time we have left, we'll, we can have some larger group discussions. But I would encourage you to find someone that's doing what your campus needs to have done and then uh, make that happen at your campus or, uh, or in whatever aspect that you're involved with. So let me start off and see who I'm talking to and see if I'm talking to the choir or if uh, we've got some people that need some new information here. Uh, how many are veterans? Okay. Uh, how many are uh, Army veterans? Okay. How about, uh, let's see, I always save the Marines till last because they always make all kinds of noise and stuff. So um, when I was going through airborne training as a young cadet at the Air Force Academy and I got my jump wings, that, that was my first visit to Alabama was jumping from Georgia into Alabama. But when I, when I did that, um, that was my first encounter with a Marine. And he always sat, I, I, this is a long time ago, Mike, but uh, I jumped out of C-119s. They were called the flying box car. And I think I was the last cadet to jump out of a C-119. Anyway, we had a Marine in our, in our uh, training group, and he always got to the back of the plane and used uh, static lines. And so he's always yelling, let me out, let me out, but you can only go as fast as the 40 static lines in front of you. And so he was always getting the static lines all crammed. But anyway, that's my experience with Marines. So I'm saving them till last. So let's see, we had the uh, Army. Raise your hands again, the uh, Army. Uh, great. Thank you for, uh, I, I'm not supposed to out anybody, but I think in this group we're a little bit more uh, close together. We can, we can do that. So I appreciate you letting me know. No one, no one has to raise their hand in here. Okay, how about Navy? Great. We're in, uh, we're in Navy country, I know that. So I have to be careful with any, uh, any of my disparaging jokes about fellow Navis, Navy people. Um, let's see. And then uh, Air Force? Great. Okay, good. Well, there's, a, there's, there's three of us here. We, we ought to be able to hold our own. Uh, you know, Air Force was uh, one of my nephews is the offensive coordinator for the uh, U.S. Military Academy. Um, and uh, they were beaten by Air Force this year, so that was really a fun game. Uh, half the time I sat on one side and half the time I sat on the other side wanting him to call good plays but also wanting Air Force to win. So even though there's only a few of us, we, we should be able to hold our own. Um, and Coast Guard, any? we have some Coast Guard here? None. Okay. So mainly Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. How many are counselors in um, counseling? Great. Okay. Terrific. And some of you I see ra have raised your hand several times. Uh, how, how many are working in veterans' offices at your campuses? Wow. Wow, sounds like perfect group here. Well, see, you already are the experts because when I want to know something about the um, uh, GI Bill, and I was the Vietnam uh, era GI Bill, um, when I want to know something, um, I, I don't uh, consult myself about the 9-11 the GI Bill. I, I would go to someone like uh, Adelie or, uh, or to Sylvia or someone in the office. I would go to one of my students, like Tim, and find out about that. Well, anyway, um, this is, I, from what, just from this little survey, this is a group of experts. And so the last part of this whole presentation, if you've seen someone raise their hand and you need to know something, I would go to the experts and talk to them about it. At Rio Hondo, we do have a veteran center, and everything I know about that is our numbers have tripled. You'll see that on our slides. We have so much to do. We have so many people. The flood is just about ready. To, the wave is going to be here. You saw the numbers. So there, there really is a lot for us to do. We don't have enough resources. We've got to be efficient. We have to be smart about what we do. We have to use the resources that we have. One of the things about um, um, Dr. Baca that he's done, not only has he done all those other things that I, I mentioned about him, but he, but he also is uh, our advisor to our Veterans Club. And what a great resource. And if you don't have a Veterans Club, you ought to think about starting one of those. So let me tell you a little bit of the story of how I started. I was, um, I, I want to uh, express my appreciation. Um, I, I'll start off with, um, and, I, and I think you need to do this as well. Let me, I, I, I we'll need to do some discipline here, but if you can um, uh, turn to the person that's closest to you right here, I don't want you to say anything, but I would like you just to um, 
grab their hand and look them in the eye as if you were going to say something to them. If you just could, could do that. This is called the icebreaker, by the way. Just, just look them in the eye. Okay? I, know you, see, I knew you didn't have the discipline not to say anything, but... Okay. That's the beginning of what our veterans need, is they need someone that greets them, and, and, and the handshake is important. I, I, I don't mean to go into too much detail about this, but we need to teach people how to do that. It can't be, like you're gonna, it can't be the handshake that you're going to conquer someone, and some of our servicemen come across that way, or it can't be the handshake where you're going to try to seduce someone. It's got to be a handshake of respect, and, and you've got to look someone right in the eye because they have to know that you really care about them. I was at a meeting the other day, some, a bunch of students were asking a president, um, not at our college, but another president, and they were saying, what is the most important thing that a president of a college can do? And, and it, was, it was incredible. He, he just said one word. He said, has to be, you know, has to be smart, has to have education, all that stuff. He said one word. He said, the president has to care. And I think all of us have to do that, too. And I, I think we have a motivated group. I, I, I love when things are simplified that way. We just need to care. And this is a group that does care about what's going on. So, so putting a face to a veteran, when I was asked to do this, last night inspired me uh, so much to say, what is the face of, of a veteran? When I started, I was uh, 18 years old. I had two cousins, uh, Gary and Burl. And so I kind of dedicate this presentation to both of them. They joined the Army, won the 101st, won the 82nd, both went airborne, both went to Vietnam. Uh, Gary uh, came back, uh, uh, married, was divorced, came back without a foot, by the way, and, um, and he was one of my heroes. He was an older cousin, and, um, and he got a job in the post office, not only served his country and, and lost a foot in Vietnam, but he also, he also came back and worked for the, for the post office. I remember my other cousin, who was also older, and he went to Vietnam, and he came back addicted to heroin, and he died in an auto accident here uh, in California. Um, they're, they're the heroes. I, I'm not a hero. I'm not a war veteran. Uh, you, know what, you know how I got to Vietnam? I went to Vietnam in the summer when I was at the Air Force Academy, because that's what we did in the summer. We jumped out of planes sometimes, and then sometimes we went to Vietnam or places that, things like that, that were happening. I know what it's like, the surreal feeling when I um, landed at, um, um, at, uh, in, in Thailand and, um, and, I, and, and some of the lectures and briefings they gave us from everything about where we should go and how we can stay out of trouble and to make sure we had protected sex. And I, I mean, it was, you, you get this briefing, a really straightforward information um, from the military. And then I went in country uh, into uh, Vietnam. A and I'm not a Vietnam veteran. I, I'm not... You know, if I ever run for political office, don't, don't ever have this on the video that says I'm a Vietnam veteran. I was there for a couple weeks. And, but, when I, but when I went in country, one of the first things I did, I got into Saigon at the, internet, at the airport in Saigon. And um, did you know what was before rap? Remember? It was, co when, it was called, they, 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 there was a dance. It was mainly African-American uh, uh, soldiers, and when I, I was, I was scared out of my wits, but they were, they were African American s s soldiers, and they were really united, and they had come out of the bush in Vietnam, and they had beards, and they had M16s, and then they got together, and they started, it was, a, it was the dance was called the DAP. Have you ever, anyone, anyone heard of that? No one probably has. Anyway, when they did that, I thought, I thought the guns were going to start firing right there in the Saigon airport, and, and now it's Ho Chi Minh City, but anyway, um, I, I, you know what I learned out of that? And this is what you need to know when people come, uh, come back to you from the service. They have been exposed to all, people from all around our country. And yes, they've had discipline, but they've had to be a team. And uh, when I saw that, uh, what, I, what happened was it broke down some of my stereotypes of, of different segments of our society. And then when I went to, um, I was, when I landed in Thailand, there was a guy in the barracks with me and um, he had turned state's evidence on uh, drug charges. He was a military, but there was so much heroin, so much marijuana available during Vietnam that they transferred him. Guess where they transferred him to protect him? They sent him in country into Cameron Bay. So, so I got off the plane at, in Thailand, met this guy. He's, he's running from people that are going to kill him because he's been dealing drugs. 
So I, I fly in a C-130, we land at Saigon, and then I take another little puddle jumper and I go to Cameron Bay, which was the resort place uh, uh, in, in Vietnam. And when I got there, this guy's standing there in line to go to a movie theater. They, they sent him in country from out of country from the drugs. So people come out of the service, just like my cousin, and they come out affected, and it affects the families, and it affects the people. You need to know that, that they've had those experiences, and the Im important thing people need to do, like my cousin didn't get a chance to do, and when he came back home, he was a different person. He had different values, and he had experienced different things, and no one got through to him. My other cousin did. They were the heroes of war, and they needed to be treated. Neither one of them got education, by the way, and they needed... They both of them needed that. What we have to offer is, is important. It's emotional support, and I'll have some slides about that, but it, they're real brief. But I just I wanted to tell you that little bit of the story. That's how I joined the service. And, and then when I, uh, when, I, when I first came on active duty after uh, completing the Air Force Academy, my first assignment was overseas. I volunteered to go to Vietnam, whatever, but they sent me to England. I was a communications electronics officer flying a desk you know, and as, a, as an officer. It was, it was real dangerous kind of duty there. But anyway, um, but then I, I came back to the United States. I did go to Oklahoma when I came back. And uh, I was, I, while I was overseas, the, the Air Force gave me a chance to get a master's degree. I got it in psychology and counseling. And the Air Force at that point in time was suffering from severe um, racial conflict. It was suffering from severe drug alcohol abuse of people coming back, especially from Vietnam. This was after 1975. So we had significant alcohol problems, significant drug problems. I took my psychology degree. The Air Force made me a substance abuse rehabilitation officer. And, and I tell you that because that experience, even though I'm not a combat veteran, that gave me an experience of people and how they were coping with those things. And guess what? You as a group, since most of you raised your hands, are going to see those same kinds of people, different experiences, different part of the world, but they're going to come back to you with that same same kind of um, heavy burden that they are carrying. And some of them, you know what they really need after all my study of counseling, just like uh, I was just mentioned to you about what's important for someone to know is, is to, or, or uh, the trait of a president is to care. Well, I always tried to boil down the counseling and psychology. And I remember having a group of young airmen and I was counseling them because of their substance abuse. And um, you know what, it really was, it boiled down, it was a matter of choice in how they were dealing with the stresses they were feeling, not, not so much that they had these unresolved, great unresolved issues, it was a choice. And the same was true with alcohol. And the reason people got addicted to alcohol over in Vietnam was because I was there and the hooch, that's the place where, where, you, where, you, where you called where you stayed, was lined on one side with alcohol and uh, the other side uh, with more alcohol. Uh, like it was the beer side and it was the hard liquor side. And people worked really hard over there, just like they do in Afghanistan and Iraq. So we heard someone say something like 90 minutes of uh, boredom and 10% 10, 10 time of action. And that's exactly how it was. Um, and, and people are going to come back and they're going to have those kinds of experiences. As I progressed in my career, I did that for about seven years. And I ultimately ended up in the Pentagon and I was the chief of rehabilitation services. But having that kind of experience let me know that there's a lot of people out there. And I was fortunate in between that time to go to the community college of the Air Force. And what a great opportunity. And you are the community college of the world. You are the largest system in this nation. We are the largest system in this nation for people. And we have something to offer people. And the education is what's going to give them that step up. Uh, let me tell you just a couple other stories just to show what, what people go through. It doesn't just affect the service member that goes over. You have to look at the whole family that's coming back as well. When I was teaching ROTC, young cadets at Oregon State University, uh, which is where the Air Force got me my master's degree, got me my doctorate. Uh, when I was getting my doctorate and I was teaching leadership and teaching international affairs, I was also the casualty notification officer for all of Western Oregon. Casualty notification officer is the person when someone dies in the service, that person has to go out and face the family and tell them that their loved one is either, and, and I'll, I'll tell you just three really quick stories of when I had to go make those notifications. I learned more about myself, I learned more about those people, but it affects the whole family when, when, someone, when someone dies, when someone is injured, and when you have to go make that notification, you feel uh, what those people are feeling. And I remember driving down to my hometown of Springfield, Oregon, 
And I drove down with my commander. Now, my commander had been wounded in Vietnam as well. On the way down, he told me his story. And it was a story of guilt. And he, he basically was, he felt like he had been promoted because he had been wounded. He felt like he didn't deserve. This was on the way down to tell someone that they had lost their son. And I didn't have an address for this mom. The only address I had was a, for a hair, hair salon. And uh, the commander and I uh, went in. And, of course, we're dressed in our service dress uniform, very sharp. People know when you're coming to the front door and you've got, <laughs> you're all dressed up. And if they've got someone in the military, well, it wasn't the front door. It was a hair salon. And so we walked in there. And there were a couple ladies, and they were doing other ladies' hair in the salon. And we walked in, and we said, what, um, we're here to, to find, we're trying to locate this person. And the person kind of barked at me and said, what do you want? And, um, of course, it was the mom. And, um, and a few minutes later, we were holding each other and crying. But, it, but this, uh, her son had been killed in, a, in, an air, uh, in an airplane crash. When you have to make those kind of notifications, you see that that service to the military is significant. It, it's emotional. Uh, another one I had to talk was a, a young man who had committed suicide. He was in the um, he was in the army, and it came to us. And I had to go I had to go to the mom, um, and say, "We can't identify your son. He's missing in action." And um, and and so then we had to wait three days and go back and then confirm that she had lost her son. You so you're getting people that have those kinds of experiences that I've experienced that. That's, that's the kind of thing where they need the care that we have to offer. And we as a group have to figure out how to deal with that, how to deal with people that have lost limbs, have lost loved ones that are uh, on this uh, circuit. Well, coming full circle on, on that, when I, when I got out of the Air Force, uh, I came to a, a community college, and, uh, and I see the veterans coming back, and I, was, I, I, I really, um, I, I hope just by sharing a little bit of those experiences, that what it's made me is a little bit more sensitive to uh, veterans and to the issues that they face. And so um, I, I could go on about some of the, um, uh, some of the people in here, and I was, uh, and I'd written down a couple of, um, uh, I didn't want to leave out my cousins. I, I, I'll tell you one other story. I had an uncle, Adrian, <laughs> funny guy. He was in, he was in World War I, and, uh, and I'll go back on this one because he didn't get treatment that he needed. Uh, he was a great uncle, actually, and he lived with my grandmother. But he was in and out of the veterans' ho hospitals. He had been in the Battle of the Bulge. And, and they called him, they didn't call it uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. They called it shell shock. And, uh, and you know what he did very well? I used to, I really liked him as an uncle. He was always friendly and nice, but he would sweep. He'd sweep for like nine hours a day. He'd just sweep. Everything in, that, in my grandma's house was really clean because Uncle Adrian swept everything that needed to be swept. And he swept it again, and he swept it again. And then when he'd have a breakdown, he'd have to go back to the VA hospital. But so when, when someone comes back, these are the kind of things that you're seeing. And, and here's what the reason I had you shake hands and touch someone and look them in the eye is that's what people need when you come back. They don't need you to invade their privacy. But they need to be invited to share their story, just like I'm sharing my story, so that, so that they can get some of this stuff out. And from the presentation last night, that's a lot, I, and, and what counseling is all about, first thing you want to get them in touch with is their family. Now, sometimes they don't have family. Sometimes their wives have gone off with someone else while they've been off at war. Sometimes they come back to things that are changed. Sometimes they, they left because they didn't have a good relationship in their family. So sometimes you become that family. But if at all possible, if we're going to be efficient, what you need to do is you need to connect people back with their family and friends. Those are the best counselors you can have. Someone that listens to you and doesn't judge you and that you can share your stories with. At Rio Hondo, I think our Veterans Club does that for our, for our uh, veterans. They get a chance to talk to people that know where they've been, know what they've experienced, and then they can come back and they can. And, and so if you don't have a Veterans Club, I would, I would encourage you to do that. First thing, get them back to their family. Second thing, get them in touch with their friends. Third thing, if they don't have family friends and they seem to be all alone and lost, then, then you need to your club, your relations. You can't do it all. There are not enough of you. We have hundreds of people, and I know our staff can't handle all of those. That's why this summit, you as the experts, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, really excited about the fact that we are getting together as a group of people that care about all these veterans and the thousands that are going to flood into our schools here within the next six months, literally, and then over the next two or three years, we need to be ready to take care of them. 
And, and I think we need to be a, a combination of all this academic freedom and so on, but we need to be very prescriptive about what we're going to give to students. And I think you'll hear that and see that in the few slides that I have. So um, why don't we'll go to the, uh, the first slide here. And, and there's only eight. On the one side, there's some real specifics. And Sylvia and uh, Arlie gave me this kind of stuff um, that, that you need to take a look at. We need to counsel people and let them know, and later on I'm going to say this again, that they need to expect delays. The, the, the problem with the, the VA benefits is that, and I, I brought a form. How many of you know the uh, DD form 22-1995? Oh wow, look at this. See, you are the experts. Uh, Tim, my uh, student worker that uh, is an uh, ex-Marine, that's he said, make sure they know the, the VA form, DD form. And, and when you look at all the, uh, Adelia said, there's, there's like eight chapters in the VA. And depending on which of the chapters you're in, depends on what benefits you get, you can lose, as was mentioned before, you can lose $2,200 a month for your house if you don't do the form right. And when you get out of the military and, you, and, and the service member separates, if they don't do those forms right, even if they do them right, guess what? They're not going to get benefits for several months. They need to know that. They kind of need to know the truth. Tim's advice to people, and he said, can you talk to some people at Camp Pendleton for me, uh, Dr. Parnell? I said, I, I, don't, I haven't been invited to Camp Pendleton, but I'd be glad to do that. He said, tell them to pay attention when they're, when they're exiting the military. Some of them are so anxious to get out and get back home, and they, they don't listen. They give them a lot of stuff at the end. But they should save all that. You should encourage people. If people are coming ahead of time and they're just talking about separating, Pay attention. Yes? Well, one of the things that I've noticed over the last several months is because, as you say, the veterans really don't know what they're applying for or what they're eligible for because they've been focusing on the mission and then they get out and they're supposed to figure it all out. But the um, Department of Veterans Affairs has been really good over the last couple of months and they call every veteran who applies for Chapter 33 to confirm that this is in fact what they want to do because they could be eligible for an additional 10 to 12 months on the Montgomery GI Bill. So that has started some dialogue. So there's yeah. a, a good first step. Exactly. And if you look up here, whoops, if you looked on, those, on the other slides, if you look down on that one side, these are just the technical things that I listed down that I want to remind everyone, and you as the experts already know. The other side, that was the left side of the, the screen. On the right side of the screen are the economic, what I'd call the psychosocial things that you need to be aware of for people. Just those getting people, and, and that's, again, I'll, I'll go back to that's simply if you can grab someone by the hand in that straightforward handshake and look them in the eye and say, you have a place here, and, and it doesn't take very long to do that, and I know you're busy, and I know the lines are long, and I was, uh, I, 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 the couple that were here, I, I had uh, at breakfast over here, a couple from San Jacinto, and they were, they were telling me about how they don't have time to see all the people that are at the doors. So in, in uh, you know, one of the suggestions, and some of you probably have some of those others, we have groups coming in, groups of 30, to try to get priority registration. And it takes days, and we set up, and we try to serve all of them. But you know, they, they help each other out when you do that when you get the veterans coming together. So there are some ways we can think about how to serve them better if we take some time to do that. If you look down here, just as it was mentioned here, you need to know the difference. And if you don't, find out. We don't all know this. I don't know all this stuff. I'm, like I said, I'm a Vietnam era uh, benefits person. But they need to know post 9-11 Montgomery um, GI benefits. They know, need to know, even if, you know, there's some older guys still coming back for, that are Vietnam era. And so you, you have, have all of those kinds of challenges. They need to know up here um, that they need to set up a plan. I think we need to be a little bit more prescriptive. And I think Linda will tell me at the state level, we're on a pathway to become more prescriptive with our transfer model curriculum. And our, our uh, GIs need to know that. They need to know that you can get in and you can get out if you pick the right degree in, in 60 units. And, and so those are, that's a marriage. They aren't even connected. Senate Bill one, uh, 1440 and this are not. But, but you need to know that, and you need to know that there are degrees that they can get in, keep their benefits, get the courses they need, and move on. Uh, they need to, um, and I just came from my uh, veteran in my office. He said, as much as possible, they need to go if they can attend full time. And, and, they, and it's difficult if they have families. 
if they've got a, a job and so on. But, but if they can, with the benefits, if they can get in, get that degree, and get moving on, it's going to help them be more competitive in the job market. Yes? I'd just like to share a concern from some, some of the veterans in California Community Colleges. And I suspect that some of you have responded. I don't know if the audience is all California Community Colleges. But our academic calendar doesn't support year-round. And so they don't get their basic allowance for housing every month because we start, for example, and I don't know, I'm generalizing here, so I'm sure there's some exceptions. But a lot of us don't start until January what? 25th. Sure. 26th. First of February. Yeah. No rent for the month of January. Okay. Two in the back wanted to say something. Go ahead. Huh? I, my, my, my mic won't go that far. but yeah. I'll try to repeat the question if you say it so we, we can record it here. In response to, to your comment earlier, really, what, what happened there is the GI Bill used to pay break pay. They used to pay people between like the, the end of fall and the end of fall. Somewhere last year, Congress decided to stop doing that and they're going to wiggle this way. And just, this is a problem that, as of right now, we've been trying to help our veterans resolve in, with emergency measures, like telling them things like, hey, Walmart might be hiring for Christmas, go find a job, mm -hmm. pay your rent, because they literally cannot pay their rent on the 1st of January without the GI Bill unless they get money from someone else. Okay. And I don't see a way around that except for Congress fixing it. Now, something some local colleges, the, this question or the comment was about the break in pay and what uh, uh, veterans need to do and need to be prepared that that could happen. There are some emergency loan funds that are available some campuses to different kinds of sources that can help for books and so on. Yes, in the back. Uh, you know, I actually think it's wonderful that Ms. Benny can talk about this subject for two reasons. One is uh, J. Corey Chase you know, has, has an interest in, in some of these things in that financial literacy and budgeting is a component of this. Because of the federal policy of, the, of no break pay, um, we may not change that federally, but we can work locally. Region A is working with some local yellow ribbon private institutions for the summer break, it, because our summer offerings are being reduced in the community colleges. So it's an idea of having these uh, veterans attend a local private yellow ribbon across the zero dollars in tuition and retain their, their housing allowance. It's, it's Okay. I mean, sad comments, but it's what we're facing, and if we don't get to the light of day, we're not going to be able to address some of those issues. Yes? I know that our institution is very strong. Yeah, we can't hear back here. If Okay. Uh, you know what I'm going to try to do? I, I really only have, like I said, eight slides here. Let me go through those quickly. It'll, it could stimulate a whole bunch of questions. And just to document this, because these are great questions, and I just have this uh, one mic. Uh, if we can come up maybe and document some of these comments, and that'll be, uh, that's how we'll end, uh, end this session, if that sounds good to all of you. Let's, uh, anyway, over here, let me look at some of the economic factors that we need to take a look at. I, I think a real thing is getting people to talk about their experiences is, is the best therapy possible uh, down at the bottom. You need to know that they, they may be self-medicating in all kinds of ways, and that, and that is a reality. And you need to know what services you have available to do that and what services they have avail available uh, that, are, that are either through the uh, veterans uh, or, or through um, local agencies, social service agencies. Some of the uh, psychological... Uh, factors and, and they were really covered well. The, we're, we're trained, we go through this basic training and we become these people that respond to orders and say yes sir and no sir and yes ma'am and no ma'am and they come out and we come out and that's how we communicate with other people and there is a culture change and there's a difference about putting a uniform. I could identify when they were talking about that. When I uh, separated, uh, when I retired from the Air Force out of McCord Air Force Base um, and I was, uh, I was single and I had, uh, I had a row of blue shirts, and I had my service jacket, and I had uh, one dark blazer, which is the standard issue, uh, one dark blazer, and with a white shirt, and I went to a sister-in-law, and she had got me some gray pants. That's how I started, you know, and, and so, but it was so easy when I was in the military, I just, you know, I put on my, one of my 
10 blue shirts or, you know, had a winter wear, had a summer wear. And uh, so sometimes people have to say, uh, I've, got to, I've got to adjust and learn how to, you know, put on a different colored tie. By the way, I'm dressed by my wife, Sylvia, today, so it has nothing to do with my <laughs> military training. Uh, okay, uh, so that reacclimating to civilian life. And then injuries and uh, disabilities. They, they're, they're tend to, there is a, a tendency to not want to admit to, especially the psychological disabilities, not to admit that you're having nightmares, that you're not sleeping, that you're, that you're having trouble focusing, that you're angry all the time, or that you're sad, or that you're sleeping all the time, or uh, all those symptoms that, that show either depression uh, or, or possible suffering from that. And you as counselors and people need to know that that's kind of what you're dealing with. Um, uh, I, I just, in our area, just heard about, and I'll, this will be in the slide again, but homelessness for our, our veterans. And, the, and the, the unemployment rate for our younger veterans is way up there. In, in our cities in, uh, in Rio Hondo, the unemployment rate is not where it's been reported like today uh, at you know, 8% or down to 8.6 or whatever. That's great news for the country. In our area, it's like 14, 15%. Some places are 19%. We have, we have large unemployment, and the younger they are, the harder it is to get employed. The people that are being employed seem to be the older people. So, I mean, education is absolutely the key to some of that. Exactly right. A lot of females, uh, single moms, uh, supporting the family, and uh, it is a, it is a challenge. And they and homelessness is real for our veterans. And so one of the things that um, in El Monte, one of those projects is to build places for homeless people, and uh, that's one of the city initiatives. It's a cop, but you, but you as the counselors and the advisors need to know that that's going on. So when that opens up and someone comes in, you say, I, you know, we've got a place for you to go down here. Uh, let's go to the next slide here. What's that? Yes. One thing I'm not seeing a lot of the stuff is that the, the signature injury coming out of these wars is traumatic brain injury, um, often undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. And that causes a lot of issues in the classroom and groups. Um, she can't hear that, so. uh, yeah, she's saying that one of the significant injuries is the uh, uh, brain, tra traumatic brain injury, which is just coming out uh, recently. So that's, and that causes a lot of um, inability to concentrate in the ca classroom socialization problems, relationship problems, and, uh, and, and it is a disability, but it needs to be diagnosed. Sometimes people just need to, you know, they've, they've wanted to get out so quickly that they didn't really take advantage of all the things that they had, and so um, there are some services, there are some places you can refer people to. The, the first thing we need to do is recognize that that's true and that's happened. So, um, Okay. This comes right from Tim, my, my um, Afghan, uh, two-tour Afghan, uh, one tour, and he's only 25 years old, and they ran out of officers, so he ended up leading his Marine platoon, I mean, in those tours. Um, his, his advice to, uh, to the veterans, and I, a lot of people raise their hands, was stay disciplined. I thought that's pretty, you know, pretty insightful. Um, familiarize yourself. Websites, and I'm going to list a few of them. You probably, and I've seen a lot of those. There's a website for just all the regions of the state for veterans. And, I, and uh, uh, Linda and Mike, I think, have that website. It's available to people. Make sure you tap into that. Once you get a, a, a website like that going, these kind of questions that are brought up, people can raise them. If you don't know, you're going to hear from someone else, or you might hear a different approach in how someone's dealing with that, like we heard in the back about someone dealing with how do you get someone through getting the mortgage paid when the, the systems and the laws are, are at odds, and we need to be looking at uh, workarounds on those kinds of things. Okay, next slide. My secretary did all these good. She went out there and found all these kind of good slides. So I had uh, Renee Gallegos, the, and uh, I don't know if Sylvia Flores is here, but she helped me out as well. So I got a lot of help in uh, putting all this together. And what, I, what we tried to do was, uh, you know, these are mainly note-taking devices, and they're just to stimulate your brain a little bit, and then you can put something down and take it with you, and, and maybe, maybe they'll help someone out. This particular one, and this will lead to the next slide, is we need to uh, be values-based. And that means that when uh, the offices that we're working on, uh, this is kind of the theory part, but, but you, need to, you need to have a high, this is uh, uh, have a high work ethic. Most people coming out of the military already have that. Tap into that. 
tap into their, that they, they're already disciplined. They already know how to do this. They can stick to it. Stay focused on those goals and then seek the assistance. It, it is a lot to grasp and it's complicated, but um, warn them up front that the pay is going to be delayed. Warn them up front that their benefits and their classes are going to be difficult to get into. I, I, I was emailed last night. Uh, my student body president emailed me and he said, I, I can't get... I can't get into, um, he, he's super bright, but he said, I can't get into physics because I can't get the prerequisite of calculus. And, and, and this is at a community college. I said, well, I, it's hard to open up a calculus section at the last minute, but I'm thinking about doing it anyway. But, it, but our, our veterans have that same problem, is, is that we're, we're, we're already maxed out with a number of students coming to us. We have, we have more FTS than we can handle right now. Okay, um, anyway, you, they need to develop a short-term plan right now, how to get through the day, how to get the money they need, how to survive, how to get some counseling, how to maybe uh, get in touch with their own feelings, where they want to go, and they need to have a long-term plan. And, and they need to find the right balance in their life while they do that. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is, I thought, this one, I like this one. It's kind of the timeline, whoops, go back one. Yeah, okay, that's all right. The, the uh, timeline, it, it, and I, I hope that you can use that. When you look at this, and, and you can go back there, um, and I put this down at the bottom, is, is that if you get a chance to talk to any, uh, anyone separating from the service, tell them to pay attention in those uh, exit briefings. That's at the bottom of the slide. That goes back before the timeline. But when they get here, they've got to have this realistic expectation, and maybe you can use this to see. This is, and, and it's not precise, but it takes... If you look at this from January, December, it's a whole year. Sometimes it's going to take them, before they get ready to register in the, this next fall, they have to start now to get eligible, to get their plan, to get their forms in, and, it's, and, and before they're going to start getting benefits. So you need to look up there. You know, they, they need to come home and they need to relax. They need some time to decompress. But at the same time, they've got to be, shortly after that, you know, you, you, you've got to... Um, what do they say when, uh, when someone dies in the family? You've got to mourn that. You've got to do that for 30 days. That's what the, the, the ministers usually tell you. You know, mourn that loss. And, and so they're, they're leaving. They've got to take care of those issues. But after that, get over it. You've got to move on. And, and someone's got to say it's time to move on. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can, um, it, it, there is no copyright or anything on that. You can take it and, and enhance it, and my secretary can send it. If you, sure, my email address uh, is p p a r n e l l at riohondo dot e d u. What's that? Get ready. Okay, I'll say I'll I'll uh, email uh, Renee when I leave this meeting and say, <laughs> Renee, you are in a heap of trouble. You did too good of a slide on this one. Okay, um, so they need to form a plan. Soon after that, you know, give, them, give themselves a week or two weeks or whatever, but then they need to do a plan. They need to see, search for a, a military-friendly school. If there isn't a veteran's office, you know, I don't want to just push it all on the people that have those, but if there isn't one there, they're not going to get the same service. They need to, and they can look around. Well, we have 20 of them that have, 20 of our colleges now have actual centers, and, and I was talking to the San Jacinto good friends in the back, and they're going to start theirs in the fall. Is that right? It's probably several of you are are starting up soon. Um, as you can see, they need to get housing and job. They need to take care of that before they get into school. And if they can go full time, you know, they, they need to find out where they can get money for textbooks. Textbooks cost more than tuition, or about the same. So they, they've got to figure that out. They've got to figure out when the fall semester begins and, and uh, that they're ready to start in. And then, and then you can see down, you know, they've got to study. That, they, they can't just say it's going to happen automatic. And we've got great tutoring services. We've got great support for students. And, and we're trying to, with not only our basic skills program, but um, at, for instance, at Rio Honda, we have a Title V grant for a Hispanic serving institution. And in that grant, we want to get more degrees and more certificates. And so we're putting a lot into tutoring. We're putting a lot into cohort classes. And the veterans, you in the veterans office need to know that and need to know that those services are available for students. And, uh, and then they need to make sure that their progress continues because if they drop out, if they drop a class, they're, they're in jeopardy of losing those benefits. They need to know the consequences. And you saw that on the other slides. Okay? Yes? So you share this timeline with them, and then what do you do? Do you like follow up with an email? Do you call them? Do you ask them to report in once a term? 
Well, the real truth is this, this timeline just came because Adali gave me some information. And I don't know, do you think you do something like this with people already sit down with a timeline? Uh, Okay, see that's where, um, and uh, Adelie's in our, uh, in our uh, veterans office there. I don't do that work, but, I, but they do, so thanks. Anyway, we can, uh, it looks like she wants to talk to you afterwards, okay. All right, just a little bit uh, more informational facts. This is, these are some of the websites. You probably already know these. I didn't know the audience. I would guess all of you know this. The um, uh, GI Bill, VA government benefits post 9-11. You need to know that stuff, and there's a place you can go, and you can send the vets to that website, and they can figure that stuff out. Um, they need to know where they are and what they're what they're entitled to, and 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 so they don't go months without getting financial support. Um, the Veterans Administration. This uh, this uh, blew my mind when uh, Sylvia and and uh, Adelie, they they sent me this back. When I said, give me a few inputs. They said, well, you need to know about eight different chapters out of, I, you know. There's a lot of information that you need to know, but there's a website. You can go and you can check that out, and you can, and you can study that and understand that, and so can a veteran. As far as academic requirements, and I put down our Rio Hondo about how they get uh, and, uh, those academic requirements and how they meet those at our particular college. They're different at different schools, so you need to check, check that out. Linda. How many uh, do the I've called you Linda, I'm sorry, yeah. How many of them send them to the online, the VANAP? 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 Yeah. It looks like about half a dozen send uh, applications to the VANAP. Okay. All right. Okay, one more. Yeah, it, it is complicated. Okay, this particular slide is just for you to be aware of things that are happening. I mentioned some of these. New language, um, new legislation that's happening. Um, and, and you can see that there are different age uh, for different uh, benefits. That you, and you just need to be aware of that. Homelessness, you just need to recognize it's an all-time high. And, and it's probably going to get worse because our, our unemployment rate, even though it's going down slightly, it's not a significant enough one that our young, especially our young women, as mentioned before, and our young men that are getting out of the service, there aren't jobs ready, readily available for them right now. That's why the education is even more important for them to get into an education program. Um, every school is different. They need, to, they need to know which ones have the full centers or not. Knowledge is uh, key to this one. And then I've, I've gone ahead and put Sylvia and Adelie's phone number if you wanted to get in touch with our Veterans Center. So thank you for letting, you know, I didn't ask their permission, but if you get a few million emails, just, just forward them on to Renee and to me, okay? Okay, next slide. Okay, this is the last one, and then I, let's open it up and we'll have people comment about what we've said here. This is another thing that I hope you might, someone might take and develop. This is, this is kind of like from the theoretical to the practical. And theoretically, what you want people, and the military people understand this, you want to focus on the mission and goals. And so that if you have three mission, one is to adjust to a new way of life, continue their education, establish a career. Those are big, lofty goals. In order to get there, you have to do planning. Any of you been involved with total quality management? That was one of my assignments in the Air Force at the Pentagon, was, um, was uh, total quality uh, uh, management. And, and one of the keys to total quality management is you plan, 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 and then you execute. I mean, the, the planning, you can put a few more plans in there. Well, so they need to come up with a plan. And the way to adjust to a new life is deal with personal issues, because that's going to keep you from moving on. The way to continue your education is identify what you want. And there was a, I, I, and I'm not against our proprietary schools. Some people are very much against, and there may be some proprietary school people here. But they cost a lot. And there's big debt at the end of that. And I was just looking at, and I've got, brought several newspaper articles the, uh, of all the major, you know, um, major companies that are providing that, that, those kinds of proprietary college services. And their completion rates are like, Yes, 65 to 70 percent drop out of those programs. And what do they have when they're done? They still have to pay the bill, and they've lost their benefits. Yeah. And, the transfer, the credits are not transferred and sometimes they're not accredited, and there are a lot of promises. And, and literally millions of dollars are made on that. We don't have the capacity to serve all that, but we certainly have a better deal 
than uh, in community colleges than most do. So um, they need to see where they want to go, what their skills are. Guess what? When they came into the Air Force, they took the Air Force vocational, um, the ASVAB, uh, vocational ba uh, battery. And, and every service has something equivalent to that. So they have some idea of where their skills and their strengths lie. Instead of just rejecting that, take that with them and say, I've got an aptitude for, and they did something in the service. And, and, and so they need to take those and see if that's what they want to continue doing. Um, then they need to, in terms of establishing their career, they've got to figure out the cost and how they're going to get there. Now the actual implementation, here's how you do it. This, is, this, is, this, is, this might be the plan. Start talking to, like I said before, and, I, and uh, the best way to, I taught, when I taught college algebra, you know, the best way to learn if you don't like math is you go over it and over it and over it and say the same thing over and over again. It's really boring, but guess what? You get really good at it if you keep doing that. Anyway, talk to family, and I've said this before. Talk to friends, and if you, if you don't have the family that wants to hear those stories, you don't have that relationship, talk to the friends that do. If you don't have the friends that do, if you feel like you're all alone, come to one of our colleges and talk to one of us. Um, apply to a military-friendly school. I put our, down, our number down here. The CCC apply is a, is a great way for someone to get their application in and be done with that, and they can do that online. And then uh, at the end, this goes back to my marine uh, student worker. You know, study hard, get good grades, keep at it, don't give up. So I'll leave you with a couple military quotes, and then we can go on. My, I believe in paradoxical leadership. I was really glad to hear um, uh, uh, retired Major General Garrett when he mentioned over here and uh, he talked about that he was a reluctant, he didn't volunteer, the governor appointed him, he had just done a good job. I wish that that's how we elected officials. Uh, you know, instead of people selling themselves, how about just, you know, they did a good job, so you can do this. But, but um, anyway, some of my favorite um, paradoxes are the people that want it the most, easy want it for political or, or, or because of their ego or something. And what we need are just good people that want it because they care and they want to do a good job. Um, but l let me leave you with these kind of three quotes and, and then, then I'll hear from all of you. Um, the, one of the greatest speeches ever given by uh, Winston Churchill was in World War II and it went on the BBC and it was something like, I have nothing to offer you but blood, sweat, and tears. That's, I, I really, I, I would quote him, it's a paradox. I don't have any great answers to offer you. It's a big challenge. I, I don't have more resources. I don't have more money. Um, but you know, when he said those words, paradoxically, everyone rallied around that. And they, they did put their blood, sweat, and tears into it. And we can do the same thing here. The other thing, he, he was invited when he was uh, 89, I think, he was invited to speak at Harvard. You probably heard this story. He showed up, uh, Winston Churchill showed up. And uh, he got up on the stage. And I think he said it three times. I'll only say it once. But he said, never give up. End of speech, sat down, applause, it's kind of like care. So I'll quote him. Um, D Douglas MacArthur is one of my favorite ones. And he said, um, when he did the duty honor country speech to the cadets at West Point, he said, and this is how I feel, unhappily I possess neither that eloquence of diction, that brilliance of metaphor, that poetry of imagination to tell you what these three words mean. And that's how I feel before all of you because I don't really have all the words to tell you how to conquer this, but I think a lot of it's our positive attitude, our working together so that we can do that. And I will end up with my, one of my all-time favorites, Abraham Lincoln, when he gave the Gettysburg Address after that terrible carnage on the battlefield of Gettysburg. And paradoxically, there was a guy that spoke before him, spoke for six hours. And you know, I, I, you know, I'm not gonna threaten you with that. I've, I've spoken far too long. But his words were, he, he said, Abraham Lincoln said, well, you know, after he said four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all men, and when he didn't have that, time, are created equal. And he didn't, I think he knew what he was saying. I think he believed the words, but they have last forever and ever. But his next line was, well, the, the world will little note nor long remember what has been said here, but they will remember what's been done here. And, you know, he was actually paradoxically wrong because that's probably one of the most memorized speeches in American literature is that Gettysburg Address, and it's very short and succinct, but it's very powerful. I would have hoped that I could have said something more powerful in a, in a shorter frame of time,
but I've shared with you who I am, what I am, and why don't we at this point in time, I'm done, and let's uh, have a question and answer and dialogue, and we'll try to get this recorded so you can come up here if you want to make a comment. So thank you for your kind attention. Um, hello. Um, my name is Brenda Antrim. I'm a librarian, actually, out of San Monica College. And I just wanted to share very quickly, we've been working for a few years now. We have a Veterans Resource Center. We have a very active Veterans Club. Um, we have a Veterans Advisory Board. It's been scratch all the way, um, but it's really worked out well. And the only thing that I can say is we're still having problems with getting our vet. We've tripled the number of veterans that we've had in one year. And we have at this point over 400 veterans that self-identify and use the center. We have a high-tech grant that we've gotten that has um, allowed us to get technical assistance like audio pins and these sorts of things. Um, but it's a constant struggle to let our students know that we're there. We're basically the only office in a building that's scheduled to be torn down. Um, so we're literally scratching for everything that we can to get this. And it gladdens my heart to see this much attention from around the state. Um, and I just wanted to say our battle is ongoing um, for the people who have battled for us. So um, good luck. <laughs> and uh, ask us if you have questions on what we've done, because I'm certainly going to be asking various people that I meet here on what they've done. Okay. That's uh, Brenda Antrium from Santa Monica. And, and so, yeah, email her. No. <laughs> Oh, okay. My name is Matt Lorscheider, Cerritos College Veterans Resource Center. Um, I'm a Marine veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom. I was discharged in 2004 honorably. I was discharged June 11th, 2004. Ten days before that, while I was on terminal leave, I walked onto the campus of Long Beach City College and said, what do I do now? Uh, the vast majority of veterans I come in contact with, and we have a policy in our office, every new veteran talks to me when they come in. If I'm at my desk, that's, one, that's the first stop they got to take because i got to make sure that the veteran understands exactly what they're getting into. I, I noticed the timeline, and it, it looks really good, and you did a great job with that. Um, but I wanted to caution you against... One thing I know about a lot of our veteran population at Cerritos, in my experience as a veteran, when I discharged, I didn't go home to where I came from. I'm from Fresno originally. Fresno is a dump. I didn't want to move back. I moved to Long Beach. <laughs> hey, uh, my parents are still there. I love my family, but I wanted to move somewhere where there was a beach. So I moved to Long Beach, because there's beach in the name. <laughs> and I basically used my LES to qualify myself for an apartment that I really couldn't afford otherwise, um, knowing I was going to get out of the Marine Corps, and was living there, was supporting myself and my fiance at the time, and really I didn't have a lot of months to not be getting benefits. I applied for unemployment my first day, the uh, first day I got my DD-214, and I went to school right away because I needed to pay the rent. And as much as education is important, and it, my education is serious to me, I'm, you know, now I'm in graduate school, you know, it's all started at a community college, but, you know, there's two parts to this. One is we want our veterans to get educated so they can get jobs, we want our veterans to get educated so they can move on to the Cal States, the UCs, and, you know, do great things. But another part of this is the GI Bill might be the only option for a lot of our veterans to pay bills, to pay rent, to pay car notes, to pay credit card debts to eat, to feed their families. A lot of veterans have kids, have families to feed, and there's not a lot of job options, especially for you know, a guy like me who was in the infantry. I shot a machine gun for four years. I'm not gonna come out and you know, be a rocket scientist. There were no jobs, and this was in 2004 before the economy tanked. Right now, police departments aren't hiring, no one's hiring. You know, combat veterans with you know, experience in artillery aren't really gonna find a lot of opportunities. So we've gotta make sure that we're smoothing that process. And, and there's a lot of obstacles, as we all know. We have veterans that come in two days before the semester starts right out of the military looking to start classes. Well, sorry, classes filled up two months ago. And, and I think we need to work together as a community college system and with the Cal States and with our partner, you know, Yellow Ribbon organizations to share information on 
that we have classes available. You know, if a veteran can't get a class at Cerritos College, maybe Long Beach City College has a class. It's local. It's not that far away. And I think, you know, I've, I know in Region 8, this region Cerritos College is in with most of the Orange County schools. We do communicate to an extent like that, and I think that's something that we could foster because we have to work together. You know, the old, it takes a village. It takes a system. You know, and, and that's the biggest difference I think I see us moving towards from when I started going to school. I didn't even know where other community colleges were when I started at Long Beach City College. Now there's a lot more communication. I think we need to step that up. And I think we need to be talking to our, our legislators and the decision makers who are doing these things to save money. And at the same time, they're really, honestly, they're number one. They're hurting veterans who need these classes and need this funding. And they're really actually taking money out of the system. If you think about how much money, you know, I'm like, Cerritos College, where, where I am, we're funded almost entirely through a federal FIPSI grant. My salary is paid from a federal grant. It's not from Cerritos College's general fund. We wouldn't be able to offer what we offer. We have a huge VRC. We have eight part-time tutors. We have a ton of brand new computers. We have all this great stuff. If I can interrupt for one minute, Matthew. I think someone else had maybe some other input. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Maybe. I'm long-winded. Yeah. <laughs> My bad. Okay. And, and my final point is we have to communicate with our administrators, our decision makers, that hurting veterans also takes money out of the system. That's going to help not only veterans, but other students. And we should keep that dialogue going, and I'll wrap it up. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, good job. Well, the, um, I think there's some other, there are some resources, and I thought uh, Martina was uh, going to talk about some of those. So. Just real quick. I'm long-winded too. Um, Martina Mancada. Okay. <laughs> Martina Mancada, U.S. Air Force veteran, um, not post 9/11, but post Vietnam. And so, you know, when I got out, I experienced a lot of things that the current veterans are. So I'm making sure that they don't face the same challenges or are denied the opportunities that are there for them. One of the things I counsel my veterans on is you don't necessarily want to use your post 9/11 GI Bill immediately. For some, I understand you need your basic allowance for housing. However, there's financial aid. And that's the big ignorance out there because I didn't go through college with the GI Bill. We didn't have it. So I had to learn about financial aid. And our veterans know, do not know a lot about financial aid. And I know when they come to our university, if you get them um, they need a sense of community, so if they live together, their housing costs will be less and they can get the Pell Grant because now they're discharged and most students don't know whether it's a, um, a veteran or not that your EFC can be changed if you document it with your DD Form 214 that you have now been discharged and you no longer have an income. So you can qualify for the entitlement program called Pell Grant, which is over $5,550. Generally, at private colleges and universities, nonprofit, um, if you qualify for the Pell Grant, you qualify for the SEOG grant, the federal SEOG. And then the next thing you qualify for is federal work study. So we can help you get employed immediately. And then where is the best place, one of the best places to network on college campuses? And the veterans in, at our university, they are terrific student employees. And not only do they qualify for federal funds, but they qualify for VA work study funds. For every 100 veterans you have, you get a position. And it's from, not from federal work study, so there's other sources. But I understand the necessity to sign up right away, I need to pay my rent, blah, blah, blah. But there's other opportunities, okay? And sometimes students don't understand student loans as well. The interest rate is 3.4%. There's no interest due the entire time that you're in school. And the federal government has just launched a program. Well, not really launched, um, just, because a lot of people don't know about it, so everybody thinks it's new. But there's public loan forgiveness if you go into nonprofit work, like me working at Alliance International University. I'm in that as a veteran because I didn't have the post 9-11 GI Bill, so I ended up in unsubsidized loans, blah, blah, everything that costs the most, okay? No Pell, no SEOG, no federal work study because no one said anything. So massive loans, and I thought, 
honestly, that I was going to die with humongous student loan debt. Now the federal government has a program that if you continue full time in school, or at least more than half time, and you make payments to the direct loan program, after 10 years, if your loan is not paid off and you're working in a nonprofit organization, it's forgiven. The entire debt, and it's not even taxable, any, taxable anymore, where it used to be under the other loan forgiveness programs. So, oh, no. Here, here's the deal. No, there's no passion here with Martina, as you can tell. <laughs> And no knowledge. It sounds like we have about uh, 20, 40, whatever different presenters that could all do that. Thank you. And, and the only reason I'm uh, cutting you off is to see if anybody else has any final one other comment here. Okay. Uh, my name is Sandra Talavera. I'm from Gavilan College. And uh, what she said about, I work financial aid and I do the VA certifying. Uh, one of the things I give the veteran when he comes in is a packet and within the packet is the financial aid application. Uh, because I know how important it is for them and I do encourage them to take chapter 30 even though they kind of fight it, you know, and I try to tell them, yeah, hey, you can use it for the four year. Uh, it's really their choice now. But uh, it is very important for them to know there is financial aid and, it, and they could qualify for the max. So uh, the, one of the things they should do, I mean, the, I mean, I encourage is for you to give them a packet or give them the web page so they could go in and apply for the financial aid. Great. Okay. Um, it, it sounds like we have a lot more discussion to be had here. And I thank you all. Um, I think we're toward the end of this, uh, Mike. Earlier, there were questions about the, um, the PowerPoint. Um, apologize, there was built-in animation, and I had to delete that. Uh, otherwise, uh, sorry for that distraction. But all the PowerPoints are being um, collected and will be posted on the Faculty Association website, FACCC.org, which is also in your packet, all the directions there. It should be, according to Sylvia, about two weeks. Some of the PowerPoints she has already, but she expects totally um, to have it all up in about two weeks on the website, and that's a good resource. Also in your packet, um, there's a description of um, veteran service regional represent representatives. There's 10 regions. That's a, another place to, to network. Um, I attended one of those meetings. Uh, many of those folks are here. Maybe all of them are here that are there. Uh, they do um, network with each other, and the last one I had, uh, they had a couple people from the federal VA administration answering questions about veteran certifying official and veterans aid that they needed to know and that information hopefully will be distributed. But use that information in the back of your packet that shows the, the reps uh, to help network e with each other just like uh, Dr. Purnell said. About all I can say is good luck. God bless you all. You're doing great work and uh, good to be with you. So thank you all. Thank you.